Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. To all the moms watching, we're so thankful for you. We hope you feel loved and appreciated on this special day. If you haven't already seen it, there's a video by some of our kids called, I Love My Mom. The kids ministry here at Mandarin wanted to show some love to all the moms. Check it out on our Facebook or YouTube page. So Susan, as a mom, what are some of the ways we can honor, celebrate our moms today, even though we're stuck at home? Well, for sure, I always appreciate a homemade, delicious, elaborate lunch. Um, just make sure you clean up the kitchen after you use every pot and pan in the kitchen. So, or if you're my kids, um, an option would be about three weeks ago, your mom's a first responder. Um, you can go to Polo Tropical and get 50% off a full meal for six for like $25 and there's no cleanup. That works. That works. <laughs> Truthfully, um, I don't know that I can speak for every mom, but I know for me as a mom, one of the nicest gifts I can receive is to be told, I love you, mom. So dads and kids, there's still time to celebrate the mom in your life. So make sure you take some time today to honor her. If this is your first time with us, welcome to the Mandarin family. We are so grateful that you would join us online. If you would like more information about Mandarin Baptist Church, please text the word CONNECT to 904-747-8822. Or if you are viewing on Facebook, message us and we would love to share with you how you can take your next step here at Mandarin. Everybody watching, be sure to check out the post with this video. There's a ton of helpful church-wide information about how to give, important links, things you hear about in service, and discussion questions about scripture from today's message. These questions are great tools to discuss scripture with your family. Also, we need your help right now. There is a little share button on this video. Please share our service. Be sure to hit that share button so your friends and family can join in. Thank you to everyone who just hit the button. Also, be sure to comment throughout the service and share how God is working and stirring in your life. Even though we are not gathered in person, commenting throughout the service is a small way to connect with the Mandarin family. So we have some exciting news. We've been completely online for the past eight weeks and you're likely ready to get back to normal. Over the next couple of days, we'll be sharing about how and when we'll be regathering in person on our campus for worship services. Our staff and lead team have been hard at work developing a regathering plan that will maintain safety for all. I can't wait to worship on campus Absolutely. together again. Absolutely. It is hard to believe we have been worshiping online for so long. The regathering plan will be shared via Facebook and a church-wide email in the next couple of days. There will be changes to our normal scheduling, so be on the lookout for the regathering guide so that you can be informed. And earlier this week, Pastor Mark shared in a video on Facebook about the incredible generosity of the Mandarin family during April and some of the amazing ways God is providing for NBC. Thank you, church, for your generosity that has allowed NBC to sustain ministry, support ministry partners, and meet the crucial food needs here in the city of Jacksonville. Our mission of being the generations declaring the redemptive story of God on everyday mission is sustained by our faithful generosity. Thank you, Mandarin family, for your continued partnership in this mission. Remember, you can continue to give online at mandarinbaptist.org and select the giving tab through the Church Center app or by mailing directly to the church office. Today in our service, we are starting a new series called Habits. This series is about building habits that align our usual with Jesus' usual. Mandarin family, let's get ready to worship and gather around scripture together. Good morning, church. Let's sing together as we invite the presence of God to move in this room, in your living room, or wherever it is that you are. So let's sing his praises. Let our praise, let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign we are here for you. Yes, we are. 
we are here for you. Sing, let your breath, let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. Sing to you our hearts. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are one design. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire flow down. Let us shout. Let us shout.
as we continue in worship, church, I want to read a, a scripture to us. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. My hope and prayer this morning is that as we open the scriptures, that as we read, the Spirit of God will pierce our hearts, that it, he will change us. So let that be your goal today. Let that be your prayer. God, come and have your way. Speak to us through the music, through the message, through your scripture, God. We are listening. And we know that you will show up. So we sing to you. Chains are broken. And chains. 
about you, but I sense that there's just this beautiful standing on holy ground in this moment. And Garrett guided us into this worship encounter with the scripture out of the book of Hebrews that I think our hearts are postured for that now as we have stepped into the eternal and invited Jesus to be himself. And now we are mobilizing in and saying, Lord, our hearts are full. Our spirit is moved toward the eternal, and let your word, Lord, have its way in my life. Your word is living, and it's active. It is a two-edged sword, and would you carve away anything that is not eternal? That would be my prayer for the next few moments as we share together in scripture and in hope and with habits that will form our lives. And so I just would have this simple prayer. If you would join with me, Lord, here is my life. Here is my walk and journey. Have your way. Let your word shape my life for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So out of the second chapter of the, after the 12th chapter and the second verse of the book of Romans, I'm going to begin there and then move into Revelation. And this is a new series entitled Habits. And I really began to pray several weeks ago as we talked about the hope of the church and the power and gravity of the church. I began to think, what habits will bring this to life? There's a couple of sentences that we've shared in the last week that honestly leave me a bit undone. For instance, Just as the empty tomb validates the power of the cross and the sufficiency of Christ, the presence of God and the love of one another among the church validates Jesus as the leader of the church. I I struggle with the reality of that truth in the heart of the church And yet it's true. Colossians says that Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus prays that our unity and his presence among us will validate the power of his leadership among us. And in fact, last week, another sentence that just struck me is, of course, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Come and sit among us. And so I ask myself myself this question, what habits will bring viability to this hope that we have in Jesus that will not disappoint. What habits should be formed among us and within each one of us that will bring viability to this hope that we have? 
again, a sentence from the prior series, I believe is a habitual sentence. It's a sentence that the disciples, in essence, said to Jesus. When they said, Jesus, in your usual, things tend to happen that are beautifully and eternally unusual. The disciples were looking at Jesus and saying, your habits bring about eternal glory. Your habits, Lord, bring about beautiful things that would not happen if you were not habitual about them. And so I just return to the questions, what, what habits will we bring that will lend viability to the hope that we have as the body of believers in Jesus Christ? I think your, our habits set us up, or actually the disciples looked at the life of Jesus and said, your habits truly do seem to set you up for things that we could have never imagined in and our own, our own strength. I mean, Jesus, in your habits, there seems to be sight given to the blind. There's the raising of the dead for heaven's sake. There's love for our enemies. There's immense wisdom that you keep speaking over and over. When people come to confound you, you bring profound words of wisdom. God, there's something unusual about your usual. There's forgiveness that you give. There's freedom that you provide. There's feeding for the masses. There's walking on water. There's something beautifully and eternally unusual about your habits, Lord. And we also need to develop habits in yours as yours. And so I, I wrote this sentence, and I pray that this will become a sentence for tonight, but also, or today, but also for the next weeks as we venture into a series called Habits. Our usual and our habitual will lead others into that which is eternally and beautifully unusual. Our usual, our habitual, will lead others into that which is eternally and gloriously unusual. Habits, rhythms of grace. In Romans, the 12th chapter, the second verse, Paul began to speak to us as his people about the habit of the joy and the viability of Scripture when he asked us in the first verse to lay our lives down as living sacrifices, as an act of worship before the Lord. And then he went on in the second verse and says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you could discern what is good what is the pleasing and what is the perfect will of God? The habit of Scripture. The habit of the Word of God alive among us. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind. This is an indispensable habit. This is a practice that Scripture says will completely reform our lives into the image and the likeness of Jesus. By immersing our lives in Scripture we will begin to have a vision for what God is doing in this world. And so I would love to just talk about this habit and to, delete, to deepen our lives in this delight. I just was reading through Psalm 119. This habit will allow the word of God to be the light to our path. This habit, the habit of scripture and immersion will help us not sin against God. For heaven's sake, that should be a desire of our soul. This habit will allow us to look at one another as you venture around your room and as we begin to consider gathering together again. It will allow us to wash one another in the word of truth and to be transformed. This habit will help us deepen into the things that are worthy of our delight. This habit of scripture appears to be powerful and according to the scripture will lead us into the good, pleasing, perfect will of God. Who doesn't want to live in that place? And so we should ask the Lord, how do we develop the habit of scripture and its life within us? And I think in asking that question, we can begin to wrestle with this. Lord, could our usual and our habitual lead others into that which is eternal and gloriously unusual? I would say for you, here's the goal. The goal is not that we get through or move through Scripture or make it a habit to accomplish. The goal is that Scripture weaves its way through us. I would love to spend the next two weeks 
the weekends talking about Scripture, and I would love for you to follow up in the questions that we provide for you in pondering Scripture and asking the Lord, how can this habit of the love of Scripture, the Word of Christ just shifting our lives, how can it lead me into the eternal and gloriously beautiful and unusual work of God in Christ? And so what I would like to do tonight, today, What I would like to do in this venture is to take a 15,000-foot venture into Scripture. Next week, I would like to take us directly to ground level with extremely practical application. So hover with me for a little while at 15,000 feet, and let's talk about the habit of Scripture. In the book of Revelation, and beautifully and profoundly, we sang the Revelation song as a part of worship And in the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation, John the Revealer, John the one who has been unveiled with his view into the heavens is now revealing that to us. And in chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he speaks at a 15,000 foot level about how we should develop the habit of scripture. And so um, join with me in reading this scripture Revelation 10, verses 9 and 10. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take and eat it. It'll be bitter in your stomach, but it will taste as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I ate it, my stomach was bitter. And I would just like to extrapolate some ideas from that and just set this up for where we are in the 10th chapter because here's what's going on with John. John is the pastor of a marginalized and politically and economically powerless group of Christians in a society in which their commitment to following Jesus literally branded them as as criminals and as people who were antithetical to the state in which they lived. And that's who John is speaking to as a pastor. And his, his role as a pastor was to keep their identity focused and centered in who they are as children of God, their lives spirit-filled, their discipleship passionate, their hope given over in the middle of all the things described, economically powerless, politically powerless, enemies of the state, if you will. He is speaking hope into their lives, and he wants to do this against every odd as a pastor. He did not choose mere survival when he was speaking to his church as pastor. And in fact, he didn't sit around and say, let me throw you a life jacket from the boat. He wanted more than that for them. He wanted them to hold on into the midst of the storm. He wanted them to be fully alive for the sake of the kingdom. That's the, that's the trajectory that John took as he pastored. John, in the midst of this 10th chapter of the book of Revelation, he's in the middle of an apocalyptic, boisterous, remarkable, celebrative vision from the living God himself that came to him out of his pastorate as an enemy of the state. He was cast onto the Isle of Patmos. And in the book of Revelation, God is speaking to him with power and we gain from this what it means to be a person of habit through scripture. So leading up to verses nine and 10, here's what John is seeing as a pastor of his church and what he is conveying to the church that he leads and what he's conveying to the church in Mandarin. He saw a vast angel, one foot, I back up in scripture and feel free to read this, a vast angel, one foot planted in the ocean and wood foot planted on land with a book in his hand. And from this land and sea pulpit, which if I could just pause for a moment and say, is that not a dream for a pastor? From the land and sea pulpit standing on water and on land and proclaiming the greatness of God, the angel was preaching and it was a prolific sermon. 
And he started, as, as he being John, started in response to the angel to pull out what many of you do and take notes and write down and say, how can I learn from this moment? What are you teaching me? And in this land and sea pulpit, how is God revealing himself? But he paused, set down his journal, realized the power of the moment, the scripture that was being read, the text that was being lent to him. And he said to this angel standing on land, and on water, would you hand me that book from which you were reading? Would you hand me the text that is shaping my life? Would you hand me the revelation of the wonder of heavens? And would you give that to me? And the angel said, I will give it to you, but you must eat this book. The angel gave it to him and said these words that should be a part of the lexicon of your life and the life of Mandarin. He handed the little book to him, the profound book to him, and he said three words again, eat this book, feast on this book, let this book be your sustenance. Here's what he didn't say. He didn't say, take notes on this book. He didn't say, um, set this on your bedside as a great decorative moment. He didn't say, get together with your, book, with your small group and study this book and talk about this book. He didn't say, exegete this book. He said, take this book into your core. Eat and feast upon this book. Let it become a habitual part of your life. Let it be the very food that you eat. He invited John to say, John, I want you to understand this is more than a nice thing that you study. This is life. This is hope. This is eternity. If you think that you're going to step up and see something that is eternally and gloriously unusual, then you will make it a habit to feast upon the book. I'm not sure. In fact, I am sure that that's not the experience or the movement of many of us toward this book that is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. But when John saw one foot in the oceans and one foot on land and heard the power and the authority, he knew I must take hold of this, and it is taking hold of me. The book that John ate, without a doubt, was the scripture. This word gives us meaning. It gives us plot. It gives us purpose as the people of God. We don't come to God in guesswork. God reveals himself, and these words that we that we feast upon, they reveal the kingdom of Christ. They reveal the word that created the heavens and the earth. They reveal the word that became flesh. They reveal the word that is our redemption. They reveal the capacity for people like us to be a people of the word and experience the presence of God in such unprecedented manner that we might look at others and out of our habits of feasting on the word, say these words, you wonder if Jesus is alive and resurrected, come sit and live among us. His word is alive. It bears much fruit. The active of eating the book means that we take it all in and it assimilates its truth into the very tissue of our lives. It is our DNA. Readers become what they read. And if the scripture is to become more than a nice chat or a good Bible study, then it must be internalized. It must be brought in and lived out for us. These words spoken and listened to written and read, are intended to do something within us. Romans 12, 2 said, it is to transform us into the image and likeness of Jesus. It is to compel us from conforming to the patterns of this world. And in doing so, our usual and our habitual will lead others into that which is eternally and gloriously unusual. So can I, can I give you two seeds of thought as we prepare to move downward in this message? Number one, place personal experience over the place personal experience under the authority of Scripture. We live in a time 
and day when we tend to want to overlay our personal experience or our view over the authority of Scripture. And the Scripture will tell us over and over that we are to put our lives up under the truth of Scripture. Here's what Paul said in Romans 12 too, if you didn't catch this. Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world. So there's an inference there that we as a people will allow personal experience to direct our trajectory into the patterns of this world and we will conform there. And here's the reality if you are to eat this book is that we will be not only failing to conform to the patterns of this world, but we will be transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. And so I just invite you to begin to ask this question. When I run parallel against the conforming ideas and concepts of this world, what is my authority? Who is my authority? And if scripture is not your authority, would you begin to pray in this way? Father, I long to place my experience under the authority of your word and to allow that to begin to shape my life into your good and pleasing and perfect will. That could be a radical change for almost every single one of us that are listening. And maybe I should just be fair. That would be a radical change for every one of us listening. Jesus As I run headlong into your scripture and your truth, and I find that it's not copacetic with my worldview or my experience, I put myself up under your truth. That could be revolutionary. Scripture reveals God. It pulls us into his revelations. It welcomes us as participants in the kingdom of Christ. It is livable. We are to be Aliens here, foreigners here. So again, look, if you're finding that you just conform very easily to the patterns around you, particularly if you're finding that you are conforming quite easily to those who are not followers of Jesus, you really need to have a moment of repentance and evaluation right now. To be able to say, Lord, there's patterns that are kingdom oriented that are not of this world. And I put my life up under your authority. And oh, by the way, God, would you hand me this book? And I am going to eat this book. I want it to be livable in my soul. I want it to direct my steps. It reveals the God created, God ordered, God favored world in which we find ourselves and oh, God willing in which we find ourselves at home. Our usual and habitual response to Scripture will lead others into lives that experience the eternal and glorious unusual of the kingdom of Christ. So first, will you place your experience under the authority of Christ? And second, as habit, will you plant the seed in your soul to feast upon this book. Habits are things that we do whether we want to or not. Habits are things that we pursue regardless of our emotion. Habits are when we put ourselves up under the power and the authority of God himself and we pursue the, tr- the truth of his word. Here's what I I know about Scripture. To recover this vision and hope that we have with all the implications of life and goodness, here's what he is saying. I want this command to spark the imagination. This command, eat this book. I want it to spark the imagination of the faith family. And I long for this book, this truth, to take precedent in the heart and the life of the church of Jesus. Most of us in this room, most of us in this gathering carry around essential truths, just parts of this book that we speak of. And I would like to add to the lexicon. Let me give you some samples of essential truths that I jotted down that I carry around in my soul that allows me to feast on this book. Love the Lord your God with your heart and soul, your mind and your strength. Love your neighbor. To live as Christ. I boast gladly in the cross of Christ. I long to know know him. One thing that I do, repent and believe. Be anxious for nothing. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. 
I will hope and I will wait in the Lord. I want to know Jesus. I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings, his precious promises and his eternal truths will lead me into the divine nature, the very tissue of God. This is one of my most recent essential truths that's a go-to for me. Go and make disciples. I have been crucified with Christ. I'm no longer conforming to one single pattern of this world. I'm transformed. My mind is being renewed. And here is one essential that across the Mandarin family should become a part of our lexicon and a habitual movement of our body. Eat this book. We should look at one another and ask one another as we walk about and as we begin to re-encounter, how has your feast been going? How has your feasting on the book been going? Is that an essential in your life? Is that habitual for you? Because here's what I know. Our usual and our habitual will serve to lead others into what is the eternal and glorious unusual. So in closing, followers of Jesus feed on Scripture. Holy Scripture will nurture a holy community. We don't learn or study or use scripture. We assimilate it. We take it into our lives in such a way that is metabolizing in our lives. It metabolizes in acts of love. It metabolizes into supernatural unity. It metabolizes into the presence and the power of the living God among us. It metabolizes into cups of cold water. It moves in the cans of food that feed the hungry. It moves into care for the orphan. It moves into the missions with global purpose and passion. It moves through the framework of our homes. It moves with healing and in evangelism. It moves in justice for Jesus' name. It moves in supernatural unity. It moves with our hands raised in adoration before God. God. It moves with our knees on the ground, kneeling before the Lord, our God, our maker. It moves with feet being washed. It moves in holy visitation before the King of glory. It moves with others being served. This motion, this movement, this word of God spoken and listened to, written and read, It is intended to do something within us. It is intended to draw out health and wholeness, holiness and vitality, wisdom and hope. Church, eat this book. For in doing so, our usual and our habitual will lead us and lead others into that which is eternally and gloriously unusual. And so I close with this prayer. Father, if you would so move in truth among us, if you would saturate our community of faith with a hunger for your word, then perhaps it would be supernaturally truthful and powerful that we could say this. If you're wondering if Jesus is resurrected, our habits are becoming our DNA. They are metabolizing into our actions. They are changing our lives. Come and sit among us. Amen. Let it be, Lord. Amen. Church, I love you. I love life with you, and I encourage you, feast on the word of God this week for Jesus' sake and for the sake of his kingdom. Amen and amen. 
Thank you so much for joining us for online worship today. A couple things before you go. The first thing is be on the lookout in the early part of this upcoming week for our regathering guide. We are so excited to worship on campus in the next couple of weeks, and you need to make sure you see this guide so you can see it on Facebook, and there'll be a church-wide email. Also, don't forget you can give online at mandarinbaptist.org and select the giving tab. You can download the Church Center app, or you can mail a tithe or gift into our office. Mandarin family, make sure you check out the discussion questions as you go eat lunch with your mom on Mother's Day, or you gather around the table as a family. I can't think of a better way to spend Mother's Day in talking about how Scripture impacts our life together. And so Mandarin family, have a great Mother's Day and have a great week. And I cannot wait to worship again with you online next week.